Well, good morning, everyone. Today we bring to uh, a close uh, this three-week series on our rewards in heaven. And uh, it's been a real privilege to be able to open the, God, the Word of God with you and to uh, share these uh, three weeks and um, look forward to what the Lord has for us today. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you how great you are. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Lord, it's been good. It's been good to sing your praise. It's been good to hear of your work uh, in many facets of ministry, including the work up in Copper Island, Lord, and your work in people's hearts. And it's just been good. And now as we open the scriptures, we want to hear from you through your word. Lord, I pray you give us a teachable spirit, a quickened mind, a softened heart that we would receive and apply to our lives that which we uh, are going to interact with. And uh, as your servant for this moment with this topic and these scriptures, uh, I am dependent upon the Holy Spirit, you Holy Spirit. Uh, to use me and to use all of us uh, in growing in our understanding of what you're doing. And uh, and so, Lord, we just commit this time to you, and we pray and ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, um, we've been, as I mentioned, uh, dealing with uh, our... Eternal rewards and uh, the believer's evaluation. Let me get my little clicker here. Does it something need to be turned on? I don't know. Or, uh, there, okay. 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 And so we've been focusing on a couple of scripture passages. One has been uh, in 2 Corinthians. Again, our clicker is not cooperating. I'm being asked to wait. There we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul writes, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Uh, This is uh, called the Bema judgment, and um, uh, it is something that every believer is going to do. We're going to stand before the Lord and uh, In our first sermon, two weeks ago, we made some general observations about this, uh, Bema evaluation, and then last week we looked at what Yeshua is going to look for from us when we stand before him. Paul also speaks of this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and I just don't seem to be working Completely, and I keep pressing, and there's no response. Okay, let me just read it. And as I, this is First Corinthians chapter three. Paul says, "If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day." will bring it to light. Uh, It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, 
he will receive his reward. Verse 15, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. And so here, the Apostle Paul tells us about this. And again, our salvation is not called into question. We are saved by grace through faith. Uh, the finished work of Messiah Yeshua on the cross is how we are saved, putting our faith in that. But this is an evaluation that will take place uh, to, uh, to assess our life. And so today, what I want to have us think about is why? Why is there a Bema judgment? Why will this evaluation take place. And the reason is, is that it has to do with God's purposes for the human race. Pretty mighty topic. It has to do with God's purposes for the human race. So that in the new heaven and new earth, Messiah Yeshua might have a bride that is a helpmate to rule the universe with. Okay? This is, this is what God has in mind with all of this. The Bema is so that Messiah Yeshua can communicate to us the responsibilities we will be able to handle in the new heaven and earth throughout all eternity. Okay? It's not a testing where he learns anything. Uh, Yeshua is omniscient. Uh, there's nothing that can be taught him. But it's a, it's a shared experience in which he communicates to us what responsibilities we will be able to do or to handle in the millennium and on into the new heaven and the new earth. This was something that was very important to Yeshua, and he talked about very frequently. Uh, it's interesting when you look at the, the whole Bible. Uh, in the uh, Old Testament, uh, there's about 20 different references to these rewards. That, uh, and this stewardship, this management. Uh, when you look at the New Testament and, and you don't take in what Yeshua says, you just look at what Paul and Peter and the writer of Hebrews, James, uh, there's about 20 references to this evaluation and the stewardship of resources in, uh, in the new heaven and new earth. But when you look at the words of Yeshua, over 50 times he raises this topic because it's an important topic to him. And because it's so important to him, it should be important to us again. And so many times in uh, the Gospels, Yeshua tells stories, and, and I'm not going to read the, the whole story here, uh, but it's a, a, a story about uh, um, some people who are given resources, some five coins, some three coins, some one coin. You, you know these. And uh, then the, the, the master in the story or the parable goes away, and then he comes back and he expects a return on his investment. And... Um, and the point of these stories is to teach us stewardship, the proper management of God's resources. Because it's in this life that we learn to manage well. Because in the future, when Yeshua creates the new heaven and the new earth, we will be managers then. And God right now is preparing a helpmate. That is, we believers, he's preparing a helpmate who will help manage the new heaven and the new earth with his son, Yeshua Messiah. 
We are co-managers with him. Now, <clears throat> many places in Scripture talk about how we, that is, redeemed men and women, uh, are going to be a helpmate, a, a co-manager with Yeshua in future times. Uh, I think of what the writer of Hebrews says, and uh, this is beginning with verse 5. Uh, look at it with me. It says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the habitable world of the future, of which we are speaking. It has been solemnly, solemnly and earnestly uh, said that in a certain place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man. Now, this is referring to mankind. Son of man is something that sometimes refers to Yeshua, but also sometimes refers to we people, we redeemed people. And, and this is how the writer of Hebrews is using it here. Or the son of man, that you graciously and helpfully care for and visit and look after. For, verse 7, for some little time, you have been ranked, uh, you have ranked him lower than and inferior to the angels. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, it's not to angels that God has given this duty of managing. It's to men and women, redeemed men and women like you and me. And he says there in verse 7, for a little time, we are ranked a little lower than angels. We'll get into that in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But he goes on, he says, you have been crowned, but you have crowned him, verse 7, with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hand. In other words, you have put redeemed men and women over the works of your hand, over that which you have created so that they may manage those things and manage well. Verse 8, for you have put everything in subjection under his feet. Now, putting everything in subjection to man, he left nothing outside of man's control. Okay, so this is God's overall plan is for redeemed men and women to manage his resources. But the writer of Hebrews goes on at the end of verse 8. He says, but at present time, we do not see all things subject to him. Okay, it's not the way it is now but it's the way it's going to be in the future. A time will come when we will manage the resources of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, here the writer of Hebrews uh, is quoting from Psalm 8. Uh, let's look at Psalm 8 uh, and, and see what it says. Verse 3 of Psalm 8, it says, When I view and consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained and established, what is man, that is, redeemed men and women, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of earthborn man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God or heavenly beings. You have, you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion, that is, to manage, dominion over the works of your hands, you have put all things under his feet. So here we have the, the writer of Psalm 8 speaking of this management that mankind, redeemed men and women, are going to have someday. And so my friends, uh, as uh, we look ahead to the future and the wonderful things of the future, when Jerusalem comes down from heaven and settles in onto the new heaven and the new earth, we, his helpmates, will co-rule. We will be a helpmate to Yeshua in the management of resources. This is spoken of very often in Scripture, and I can't take you everywhere. I'll take you one place concerning that thought. Paul in 1 Corinthians. Okay, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, he speaks of this. Uh, you, you remember uh, in 1 Corinthians, in the Corinthian church, there were a number of issues going on, and they, and they uh, 
ask Paul about those issues, and, and when you read 1 Corinthians, it goes issue after issue after issue after issue. And one of the issues that is asked about is a, a lawsuit between some of the church members, okay? And Paul's addressing that in, in chapter 6, and he says, um, uh, do you not know that the saints, that is the believers, we believers, will one day judge and govern the world? He's speaking of this future time. And if the world itself is to be judged and ruled by you, are you unworthy and incompetent to try such petty matters of the smallest courts of justice? In other words, Paul's telling the Corinthian people, you're going to manage the new heaven and the new earth. You're going to rule over these things. Um, whatever this little issue is between the couple of members of your church, you guys should be able to handle that without any big you know, situation. And he goes on, verse 3, Do you not know also that we Christians are to judge the very angels and pronounce opinion between right and wrong for them? Now, uh, this is governing over the, the, uh, the, the angel. Okay, there you go. Paul goes on and he says, How much more then as to matters pertaining of this world and of this life only? In other words, you guys, whatever that little petty thing's going on in the Corinthian church, you guys should be able to handle that because someday you're going to deal with a new heaven and a new earth. And so my friends, as we look to the future and what our blessed hope is, we in heaven are going to experience the fullness of Yeshua, and that's going to be wonderful. And we're going to worship him and adore him and experience his fullness, but we are also going to manage or rule this universe. We are going to be co-managers with Yeshua. And so as we look at this whole beam of judgment, it is an evaluation to show to us what type of work we will have for us, or what type of work God will have for us in the new heaven and the new earth for all eternity. That's why... There's an evaluation. <laughs> Pretty important, isn't it? I mean, we're not talking about some little minor part of our Christian experience. This is what God has in mind. We are going to co-manage. Now, what does that mean, co-manage? And the rule, does that mean we're all going to have little kingdoms and real estate? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I was searching for an illustration, and I don't have a perfect illustration, but I'm going to illustrate it this way to help you understand of what the difference will be, why this evaluation and some may be different in the new heaven and new earth, and what they're responsible for uh, uh, as, as uh, different from someone else. Okay, and so let me, let me just illustrate it this way. Now, I'll illustrate it through our federal government. <laughs> yeah. I, I think this will help you see, okay? The, the, the federal government of the United States employs about 22 million people, okay? Now, when I say 22 million people, that means the person that de delivers your mail each day. It also means the park ranger at Mount Rainier National Park, the washroom attendant at the White House, um, you know, the person that processes your taxes at the IRS office. I mean, when you add up all the people that make this country run, it's about 22 million people. Now, my wife Lynn is a career government worker. She's retired now. But uh, I know from her experience that when you go to work for the government, uh, you go to work at, a, at, at, people go to work at, for the government at different levels. And they have numbers for those levels. For example, when you start working for the federal government, you may start as a six. 
And if you're a six, you have a certain amount of responsibility and usually a certain amount of salary that corresponds with that. But someone else may be an eight, or they may be a 10, or they may be a 12. And if they're a 12, they have more responsibility and usually a different salary, but more responsibility and, 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 and have more resources that, that they uh, oversee. And there are some people that are 15s and someone that are 20 and goes right on up. And it all has to do with how much responsibility you have in your particular area of the 22 million that people make this country work. Okay? And so when Yeshua is teaching all these stories about stewardship and management and someone who has done well and someone who has not done well, but the one who has done well, I'm going to put you over you know, this much, but you who haven't, I'm going to put you over that. It's kind of like what we have in the federal government, okay, in terms of people at different levels uh, having different uh, sets of responsibilities. And Scripture doesn't tell us that there's any way that we can advance we're in heaven. Okay, now we, we may, but, but it's not said in Scripture. And so Yeshua's point is you do what you do now because it's going to have an impact in terms of what you do. Now, we're all going to be happy in heaven, I'm, you know, I don't want to be, you know, we're all going to be happy and it's going to be wonderful and glorious, but it will be different, okay? It will be different. And so what, you sh- what God is doing now is he is preparing a helpmate, a co-worker for his son, Yeshua Messiah, okay? And so what I want to do in the next few minutes is I want to talk about this helpmate, and to show you from Scripture how this has been God's agenda from the beginning. Okay? And uh, we're going to uh, look at two stories of helpmates uh, here. And um, actually, I'm going to start in Genesis 1, and I'm going to end in Revelation 22. I'm so happy that you don't have anything that you have to go to uh, later today. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm going to make this as brief as possible, okay? But anyway, let, let's look at what God is in, it, going about in terms of what he's doing in this universe. And so let's start with the past, okay? And the, the preparation of a helpmate. Here in the past, we see Adam and Eve manage the garden, okay? Adam and Eve manage the garden, I'm going to read a lot of scriptures, but you know the story, so I don't need to elaborate. But let's start Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them do what? Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over along the ground, okay? So here, God, in Genesis chapter 1, is creating man and creating him in the image of God with the purpose of management, ruling, overseeing, managing, okay? Uh, Chapter 2, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and take care of it, to be a good steward of the garden, okay? Genesis chapter 2, that's God's intention right at the very beginning. But as he made Adam, he saw that Adam needed a helpmate. He needed a helpmate, so God creates Eve to be that helper. Genesis 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper or a helpmate suitable for him. And so chapter 2 goes on. God is the first uh, anesthesiologist. uh, And, um, you know, then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. 
And so here we see Eve made, not from dust, but from Adam, so that she could be his, his helper, his bride, his helpmate. And together, they were to govern and to manage the Garden of Eden. And it was wonderful. They walked in the cool day with, the, with, with God, and, and they you know, were naked and unashamed, and all everything to eat, and just wonderful existence, okay? But we all know what happened. Sin ruined everything, okay? And we come to Genesis 3. And when the man saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for the gaining of uh, uh, wisdom, uh, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And so here we see sin entering the world. Satan tricked Adam and Eve, and Satan is asserting himself as ruler of the earth, and things change. They change temporarily, but they change. Um, one writer put it this way. He said, sin ruined all of this. Adam and Eve fell into the devil's trap, and their right to rule was forfeited. Satan picked up the scepter and asserted himself as temporary ruler of this world. And so sin messes up God's original design. And, uh, and, and, um, and so uh, <clears throat> I like the, what uh, uh, Urban Lutzer says here, the f- former pastor of Moody Church. He says, uh, the love story between Adam, Eve, and God was in difficulty. Instead of ruling the world, we as humans would now be ruled by the world. Disease, destruction... And death would now be the legacy bequeathed to the planet, to this planet. We would sow, but we, uh, but not be sure what we would reap. We would establish friendships, but would be overcome by jealousy, mistrust, and hated. And so uh, here we see things, sin messes things up. Okay, that's the first situation. Let's go on to the second situation. And in the second uh, uh, situation, we see Messiah, Yeshua, redeems his people to serve. God's desire to have humans as a helpmate to help rule the universe is so strong that he sends his son, in essence, to kind of clean up the mess, if I could use that terminology, and to showcase his love and his grace. And so Yeshua becomes what Scripture calls the second Adam. Okay, let me read from Romans chapter 5. For if the many died by the trespasses of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Messiah Yeshua, overflow to the many. Again, verse 16, uh, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Verse 17, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Messiah Yeshua? And so here Christ, or Yeshua, Messiah, comes as this second Adam, Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, okay, and I'm, uh, I don't know, there we go, uh, it says in 1, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, um, for as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be made alive. 
Eve. And he goes on a little bit later in that chapter and says, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that is Yeshua, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. And so here we see uh, Yeshua providing redemption that, that mankind can be redeemed to be God's helpmate, God's bride, Yeshua's bride, to be a helpmate. And so God is, is preparing this bride for his son. Okay? And this bride is we redeemed believers. And the purpose of our being a bride is to help him rule this universe. Uh, again, uh, this is Lutzer. Uh, he says, just as God sought a bride for Adam, so God sought a bride for his son, Messiah Yeshua. He chose to prepare a companion who would be able to share his son's rule over the universe, someone who would enjoy his dominion. The bride would be loved, honored, and invited to join Messiah on the throne of the universe. And so Messiah Yeshua is working with us, redeemed humanity, getting us ready to rule with him. And he's nurturing us. And that's why when, when uh, the scriptures speak of, of marriage, uh, and, and uh, let's look at uh, Ephesians 5, a place that is often quoted in, in wedding ceremonies, we see that uh, Yeshua loves us, and he, he's getting us ready to be this helpmate. And, and this is the pattern that we earthly husbands are to follow. Paul says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Messiah loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Holy, that is set apart unto Messiah. And so we, men and women, who know Yeshua as our personal Savior, we are engaged to him. We're not married to him yet. That hasn't taken place. But we are currently engaged. In essence, we're like we're his fiancé. And he is preparing us for our wedding day. He's perfecting us for our wedding day. He's still working with us. And, and as he, as he uh, is preparing us as a bride, that also makes us his, uh, part of his family. Okay, Even though this marriage hasn't taken place, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we are still part of his family. And, and this is spoken of often in the Scriptures. Let me read from Hebrews Hebrews chapter 2, it says, In bringing many sons to glory, it is fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. The one, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Yeshua is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. You see, we are part of Yeshua's family. Do you realize that? I mean, angels. Angels are not part of Yeshua's family, okay? But we are. It's what makes us unique. Paul, in Romans, uh, he puts it this way, Romans chapter 8. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. 
We are heirs. Heirs of God and what? Co-heirs with Messiah. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are co-heirs. This universe, God has made us co-heirs with Yeshua uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, of taking care of him. John, in 1 John chapter 3, says, How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, verse 2, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. See, the world as it is right now is not what's coming. God has something much better coming. Okay, we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ, and that's coming. He goes on, John goes on and says, but we know, uh, verse 2, he says, but we know that when he, that is Yeshua, appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our blessed hope. And so just as God ordained that Adam have a helpmate in Eve, and he brought about Eve to be that helpmate, so God desires that his son Yeshua have a helpmate, someone to co-manage, and he is working with us. We, his children, are his helpmates so that we might manage in the garden in the future. And that leads us to the third thing that I want to talk about, and that is the future, okay? And that is, in the future, Messiah and his bride rule creation, okay? Messiah and his bride rule in creation. And so, my friends, in this life, we are given the opportunity and the opportunity to make choices, and choices are we, we, we have the opportunity to live for the glory of God, to give our time and our resources to kingdom work. Now, God knows that we have a job that we go to and we have, you know, depending on stage of life, children to raise and this kind of thing. But he, 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 he wants us to make ministry and kingdom advancement a priority. And he wants us to show ourselves to be good stewards. That's why he had all those stories about stewardship, to be good st stewards. And so uh, as a reward for our kingdom work and our faithfulness here and now and making right choices, Messiah will give us the reward of ruling alongside of him when he comes in the millennium, in the new heaven, and the new earth. Look at what he says, and let's turn now to the book of Revelation, okay? And um, uh, I'll wrap this up soon, okay? Revelation chapter 3 uh, says, verse 21, To him who overcomes, I will give the right, get this, to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. My friends, this is the great privilege that we as redeemed humanity have. We will sit down, I don't understand this completely, but it, I'm, this is his words, we will sit down on his throne, okay? Angels don't have that privilege. Redeemed men and women. His bride has that privilege. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, uh, verse 7, it says, He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son and my daughter. We will co-rule and co-reign with him. Now, in both of those verses, it says, to him who overcomes. 
Now, overcomes what? Okay. To him who overcomes the temptation to uh, live for themselves. You know, we can listen to the beer commercial, go for all the gusto you can. This life is all there is, you know. And we can prioritize our life where everything is around me and what I want and getting the most and, uh, you know, having the best. Or we can live for the glory of God and live with kingdom advancement in mind, give ourselves to ministry and these kind of things. And if we overcome that temptation, we will inherit. You see, Yeshua overcame. And oh, I don't have time to go into all this, but at the temptation of Yeshua, you know, what did the devil offer him? You're hungry? Now, there's some rocks. You turn, you feed yourself, you know? No, oh, oh. Uh, God, you want to you live according to, to, to uh, and be dependent upon God? But jump off this roof. And, uh, you know, you, you, if you bow down to me, I'll give this all to you. See? Uh, you know? But Yeshua overcame those temptations, and he lived the perfect life in absolute obedience, overcoming... And, and, and so he says, to we who overcome, that is to we who live for God's glory and for uh, the advancement of his kingdom and for the things of, of, that he desires that we do, we will receive these things. But we have choices and we can be, um, we can give in to those temptations and succumb to wrong decisions, and unfortunately, there are ramifications of those wrong decisions. I don't need to belabor the point. We heard in our Midrash today about Moses and a poor choice he made. God said, speak, but he struck. And what happened? There were consequences. You're not going into the promised land. Okay. Now, eventually, we know Moses did because of the transfiguration. He was there, but there were still consequences, Okay. And so we are to overcome these uh, consequences, okay, or uh, overcome these temptations. And so, um, you know, if we seek to be obedient, if we're committed to kingdom advancement, if we seek to live to the Yeshua's glory, God has wonderful things planned for us. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 19. This is verse 28. Yeshua said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, that is in the millennium and on into the eternal state, renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, you know, I, I don't know what the full ramification of that is, but I'm not saying it. Yeshua is saying it. You will, you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel. Verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. He promises us all this if we live for his glory. And so, why is there a Bema evaluation? Because there's a wedding coming up. And he uh, is going to, the first expression of, uh, of, of, of these choices that we uh, make in this life will be made known at this wedding that is coming up, okay? This wedding that is the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, there will be the beam of judgment first, this evaluation first, and then comes this marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay, we await our... Right now we're engaged, but we await this wedding, this consummation of being the bride of Yeshua. Revelation 19, verse 9. 
Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so here we anticipate that day in which we will be at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now let's just think about weddings for just a moment. At a wedding, okay, we're the bride, so at, at, at the wedding, the bride is concerned about a number of things, but two. I, she, obviously, she's thinking about the man that she's going to spend the rest of her life with, uh, her groom. But the other thing, as you think of the wedding, is that the bride is thinking about what she's going to wear at her wedding. Her wedding dress. And great thought, consideration, and expense is given to that dress so that she looks a particular way. It's been 48 years since our wedding, but there's Lynn and I and the pastor that officiated, and Lynn's mom uh, made her dress, and... uh, and it was a beautiful dress, and uh, uh, and and you know that was uh, our wedding experience there, and that was the dress that she that she that she wore. Now, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm the one uh, with the beard, okay, okay, yeah, and the other one is the pastor that officiated at the at the at the wedding, okay. Now. Um, The bride is concerned about what she wears, her dress, okay? What will this dress be made of? Well, let's think about now the wedding supper of the Lamb, okay? As the bride of Christ, we as individuals, what will our dress look like? Let's look at what the scriptures say. Revelation chapter 19. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, And his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. So there's her dress. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given the bride, we, the church, redeemed men and women, to wear. Now what is this dress made out of? Look at it. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. That's what our dress is made out of. The righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9 goes on. It says, Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves as individuals is, what material will our dress be made out of when we stand at the wedding supper of the Lamb? Let me again read uh, verse 8 to you. This is uh, from the Amplified Bible, speaking of the bride. It says, she has been permitted to dress in fine radiant linen, Dazzling and white, for the white linen is, signifies, that is, represents the righteousness, that is, the upright, just, and godly living, living, kingdom advancing deeds and conduct and the right standing with God of the saints, that is, God's holy people. That's what our dress is made out of. And so let's, as I bring this to a close, ask ourselves again, then how shall we live? This life is a training for the next. 
Okay. Two weeks ago, I shared this quote to you. Let me share it again. Earl Rodmacher, he says, The person I am becoming today is preparing me for the person I shall be for all eternity. Let's let that sink in again. The person I am becoming today is preparing me for the person I shall be for all eternity. Okay? Look at what John says. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him. That is, continue to live for God's glory. Continue to be committed to kingdom advancement, being good managers of what resources he has given you today. Continue in him so that when he appears, we may be what? Confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Now when he says confident and unashamed, that infers that there might be some that might be ashamed at his coming. They come to realize, you know, I had these opportunities, but, you know, but I was more concerned about what I wanted my career, blah, blah, blah. We might. There's the possibility of being ashamed. And so, my friends, um, <clears throat> to the degree that we are seeking the kingdom of God, that is, we are men and women that, who are in the word, that we give time to purposeful prayer. We talked about these things last week. We give time investing our resources, that is investing money, investing our time and energy, making ministry and service a priority. Every day we are adding or taking away from our wedding gown in terms of the choices that we are making. We all want a wonderful gown, a beautiful gown, a radiant gown. But you know, there may be a few that when they stand before him, <laughs> the material that their dress is made out of is not the most desirable material. It's a reality. The beam of evaluation is Yeshua's way of communicating to us where we, what our responsibilities will be, what our dress will be like, what our place in eternity will be. And the opportunity he gives us is from this moment on, from this moment on, to live for his glory Amen. and to live for kingdom advancement. <clears throat> the, the, let me read from... Revelation again, 21. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. But look at how it goes on. Verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, I don't know fully what that means. But there's the potential that there could be tears in heaven because of choices made in this life here and now. And he will wipe them away. And heaven's going to be wonderful. But we are to live for his glory and for his praise and with kingdom advancement in mind. Father, we thank you that you give us your word. And Lord, as we stand uh, here and over these three weeks, we have contemplated what it is that you have for us in the future. Lord, I just ask that 
you would give us an increased commitment to living for your glory and for your kingdom advancement. That God, that we would love you with all of our heart, that we'd be so satisfied with you, and that we would live thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that we would be good managers, good stewards of whatever it is that you have given us in these days so that we might use those things as a helpmate to glorify you and to advance your kingdom so that when that great day comes, when we are there at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we can rejoice in the fruit and the outcome of what we have done in this life. Lord, thank you. And we pray that you would just help us to live to your glory. And Lord, I confess that, Lord, I am in process. And I know all my friends here, we're in process. But Lord, we want to grow in our commitment to live for your glory and to live with your kingdom in mind. And so God, work with us and help us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you. We give you praise. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.